Okay, so in the previous section, we talked about the tension that comes between the different levels of a firm's organization. You have the board that is setting strategy, talking to the manager, and then the manager talking to the workers to make sure the strategy gets implemented. But one of the issues is you have those green dotted arrows that are pointing back up, where there's, a, there's not equal information flowing back up the, up the chain of command. And so the official term for this in economics is this idea of asymmetric information where you have different levels of a firm, um, but they have different amounts of information. The workers know a lot about what's going on, but the, the manager doesn't see all of that. And the board and the, the main directors, they don't see most of that. And so as a result, behavior starts changing um, and incentives start changing and getting aligned differently when there is asymmetric information. Um, and so in the, in the marginal revolution videos that you watched in preparation for this class, um, it talked about these two different types of asymmetric information. Um, and so we'll briefly review those here. Um, so the first type is this idea of adverse selection, which I actually don't like this phrase because that, I, it's a weird, archaic phrase. The way I like to think of it is hidden knowledge. So this is the idea that if you have two different people, two parties, whether it be a manager and um, workers, or a parent and children, or any situation where you just have like one person kind of overseeing another, or having more power over them, or just any, any sort of relationship. Um, there's some knowledge that is hidden that one party would like to know, but can't. Um, and so as a result of that hidden knowledge, behavior starts changing. So in the video that you watched for, with the marginal revolution example, um, it talked about this market for lemons idea where um, if you buy a brand new car and then turn right around and sell it back to like a used car dealership, you're going to lose a ton of value on that. And the reason why is because um, as soon as it's no longer new, it is in a different type of market. It's in a market where there are potentially bad cars and not all of the sellers know about what cars are good and bad because the sellers don't want to reveal that information. They want to maximize their profit. And so if they know that a car is bad, um, they're not gonna reveal that and they're gonna try to sell it at a higher price. And so as a result, that makes it so that the prices start changing um, and people who have good cars are no longer gonna be able to sell their cars for higher prices um, because the people with the bad cars can start lowering their prices. Um, because they can, because they know that it's not worth a lot, and so they can start undercutting the good cars, um, and then that starts dropping the prices down even further. And the reason that happens is because of hidden knowledge. Um, people behave differently because they know they, like, one party doesn't know a lot about this, this one vehicle. Um, and so that starts distorting markets. And so one way you fix this is by making that knowledge no longer hidden. Um, and one way of doing that with cars is there's this institution called Carfax, um, where every car has a detailed history about it. Whenever you go get an oil change or get some sort of service done on a car or sell a car, um, there's like um, a report associated with your vehicle identification number and dealerships can look up that, that number and look at the report for the car and they can see how often it's been serviced. They can see what the problems are. Um, you can request Carfax reports whenever you buy a car. Um, and the whole reason Carfaxes exist is to remove this adverse selection. So if somebody's trying to sell a lemon, you'll be able to see it. Um, and it's no longer hidden knowledge. And that fixes that, that market failure there. Um, insurance is another issue here, where if you're trying to get health insurance or life insurance or any type of insurance, the insurance company naturally knows a lot less about you than you know about you. Um, and so they'll ask you basic questions. They'll ask you if you smoke. They'll ask you how often you drink alcohol. They'll ask you about other health concerns. And you're supposed to tell the truth on that. But they can also not ask you every possible question. They can't see every possible thing that might go wrong with you. Um, and so they have to adjust their prices. Um, and then what ends up happening um, is... Um, the prices of the price of getting insurance will start increasing because um, riskier people will go get insurance because they know that the insurance company can't see everything that's wrong with them, um, and so they will say, "I'm, I need surgery. I'm not going to tell them I need surgery, and so I will get insurance and then I'll get surgery." Um, 
And so as a result, it makes it more expensive. And so insurance companies have to start raising prices and people who are healthier don't want to pay those higher prices. And so they'll leave the market. And then what that means is the prices have to raise even higher and it creates what is called a death spiral here, um, where eventually um, these insurance markets will make will be structured in a way that insurance companies are only insuring the riskiest people and the sickest people and all the healthy people leave because it's too expensive for them. And so we don't want markets to turn into that. Um, one solution for this uh, happened with the Affordable Care Act um, under President Obama. Um, one crucial part of the Affordable Care Act was the idea of the individual mandate, where everybody um, that paid taxes had to buy health insurance. And the reason for that was to prevent this death spiral. And so that way, healthy people and sick people were all buying insurance, which allowed insurance companies to keep premiums lower because the, the less risky people were not fleeing the risk pool. They weren't stopping to buy, stopping buying insurance because it got more expensive. Um, and so having the individual mandate made it so um, the pool of insured people was less risky and less sick in, on average. And so it worked out better. Um, as we've been seeing over the past few years with the dismantling of, of different provisions of the Affordable Care Act, um, including the removal of the um, individual mandate, um, insurance prices have risen. Um, but it, it's because of this idea of the death spiral, um, where people seeing that insurance prices are rising and knowing that they don't have to buy insurance anymore are no longer buying insurance and they're exiting the pool. Um, which makes it more expensive for people who are still getting insurance. And it's, it's a bad situation, especially when you start entering a global pandemic and it's a mess. Um, but that's all based on adverse selection. The other idea is this idea of moral hazard. And again, I don't like that phrase because it's strange. Um, it's not very intuitive unless you like memorize it. Um, the way I like to think about moral hazard is thinking of it as hidden action. So hidden knowledge is you know something that the other organization or the other company or the other person doesn't know. You know stuff about your health. The hidden action is what you do after you um, decide to engage in some sort of activity with somebody. So if you go to a repair shop, for instance, for your car, um, you will pay them to go fix your car, um, but then you have to hope that they are doing a good job. Um, and if you lack the expertise to, to know what they're doing, like I know absolutely nothing about cars. If I go to a car dealership and they say, like I go to Jiffy Lube and they show you the, the air filter and they say, here's how bad your, your air filter is. I just kind of like nod and sometimes I say yes, replace it. And sometimes I say no, and I have no clue. Um, they do that because of the hidden knowledge side. Um, I, they have more information than I do. But the hidden action side is if I say, yes, go repair this, they could go back into the repair shop and just put the original air filter in and I would have no clue um, because I, know, I don't even know where the thing goes in the car. Um, I barely know how to open the hood of the car. And so I, I am clueless about this. And so because if, if they knew how clueless I was, um, they could engage in all sorts of moral hazard and take all sorts of money from me and never replace anything. And I would just assume that things are getting replaced um, because I can't see what they're doing. If I stood in the back of the, in, in the, back of the shop and watched what they were doing, um, then they would do everything right because their action is observed. But if the action is hidden, the incentives to do the right thing kind of start decreasing. They, I trust that they do it because of norms and because you can sue them if, if bad stuff happens and they don't know how clueless I am. I could be really smart. And so they don't want to cheat. Um, so I, I never tell them how clueless I am. I just nod, which is probably a sign of how clueless I am, but whatever. Um, crime prevention. This actually happens in real life too. Um, what happens often is if you get um, a car alarm, um, people statistically on average are less likely to lock their cars consistently because they know that they are protected by a car alarm and so they're not gonna worry about it as much, um, which is a really weird counterintuitive finding. Like you would think that you get an alarm because you care more about your vehicle and your possessions and stuff, but because of hidden action, like 
you become lazy and so you don't have to to constantly arm uh, constantly lock the thing because um, you're hoping it's just going to work um, another example of this is this idea of reaching exact incentives um, you've done this in countless classes including this class um, where if I say here's a list of three different podcasts to listen to choose one the majority of you are going to choose the shortest one. You're gonna open all three of them and you're gonna see which one's the shortest and you're going to do that. Um, if I say, here's this problem set and here's an extra credit problem, some of you are gonna do that, but most of you are just gonna do the exact incentives that you're supposed to do. And that is because I'm not observing you um, and because you don't get benefit from doing that and there's no reason to do it um, other than like for personal gain and because you really like economics. Um, and so that's the, the hidden action side. I can't see what you're doing. Um, I just have to hope that you're doing a good thing. Um, insurance companies have to deal with this stuff too. Um, so we did talk about insurance being hidden knowledge um, where they have to guess how healthy you are and hopefully get it right. Um, but they also have to observe your actions. Car insurance companies do this a lot um, where they'll insure you, but they don't ask a ton of questions about your driving history and how fast of a driver you are and things like that. Um, they just have to hope that you're a good driver. And so if you have insurance, your incentive is to, to drive fast because the insurance company is going to take care of anything if there's a crash. And so what insurance companies do is they try to monitor that. And lots of insurance companies nowadays have um, little plugs that you can plug in under your car where the, the where there's like a, a plug to the computer of the car. And so you can actually put like a monitoring device under the car and it will track how often you speed and how often you slam on your brakes and accelerate quickly. And depending on how good of a driver you are based on that thing, um, they'll reduce your premiums and you'll get cheaper car insurance because they're monitoring you. It's not because and you're proving that you're a good driver. It's not because they're guessing you're a good driver. It's because they can see your action now. It's no longer a hidden action. Um, so the way you fix these in general, and the reason I like talking about hidden knowledge and hidden action instead of adverse selection and moral hazard is because the solutions to these things are built into the hidden knowledge and hidden action. So if you have an adverse selection problem where you, you don't know stuff, you can fix it by knowing more stuff. You can fix it with screening. Um, and so kind of one way of thinking about this, the easiest way of thinking about the difference between these two things and how to fix them is this analogy of skydiving. So if you know that you're going skydiving next week and so you decide to get life insurance, um, the insurance company has no idea that that's going to happen. And so there's a risk that your parachute won't open or something, but they have no clue. And so they're going to... Um, have a lower premium for you, which is great for you, but not great for them. And so to fix this, they can include a question like, are you going skydiving in a week? And then that would clear up that hidden knowledge. Um, from the moral hazard side, this is the hidden action side. The way you fix hidden action is you make the action not hidden. Um, and so the example here of kind of the moral hazard issue is this idea of where if you have insurance, um, you know you're covered, then you'll take up skydiving. And then if you get hurt, oh well, you have life insurance. Um, and so if you're an insurance company, one way to monitor that is to make sure people don't go skydiving, um, which is an issue um, for like personal freedom reasons. Um, but like that's one way to fix it. This, this idea of car insurance companies giving you a little device to plug into your car, that's how you fix moral hazard. You're actually being monitored so they know your behavior is good and so they can charge you less because they know you're going to do a good job. Um, so these are two different ways to fix this. The solutions are not universally good. Um, screening, for instance, um, the insurance world right now is facing all sorts of dilemmas because of genetic testing. Um, if you get your genotype sequenced through like 21andMe and, or Ancestry.com or something, um, you get a whole bunch of um, risk factors back. You get a report saying you're at higher risk for specific types of cancer, or specific types of diseases, or you're at elevated risk for type 2 diabetes or other things. Um, and an insurance company would love that information because then they could charge you higher premiums. They would say, 
15 years from now, you're probably going to get type 2 diabetes or you're going to have a higher risk of stroke. So we're going to have to up your premiums because we know that's going to happen. Um, and that's an issue. You don't want insurance companies to know every tiny thing about you and charge you more because you might have a stroke 20 years from now. And so there's actually been talk of having legislation that limits the access of um, insurance companies to your genetic information. They can't use that for screening. Um, that's not universal yet. Um, so there, there is occasionally risk of um, like if you get a genetic test done in some states, in some situations, it is possible for life insurance companies to get at that information and um, discriminate based on genetic profiles, which is terrifying. Um, and so it's like we don't like this adverse selection idea, but we also kind of like having hidden knowledge at times. We don't want insurance companies to know everything. Um, because then it's more expensive for us as consumers. It sucks for the insurance companies, but it's great for us. Um, same thing with monitoring. If you were a car insurance company, you would love to know exactly where people drive and how fast they're driving and how fast they're braking and how good of a driver they are. The only way to get that information though is essentially put like a GPS tracker on them and a camera and suddenly privacy is gone. Um, so you're trading your privacy away for cheaper car insurance, which just feels odd um, but that's kind of the ultimate fix to moral hazard or this hidden action idea is always be monitored if you're a life insurance company you don't want your customers to go skydiving um, then you're gonna have to put like body cams on them to make sure they never go skydiving and nobody's gonna agree to that and so you're never gonna fully solve these these screening issues and these monitoring issues um, it's, there's all sorts of ethical and practical and moral issues behind um, fixing these things. So we're going to have to live with this stuff, which means policy needs to take this stuff into account because there's no way to get rid of it all. Um, a couple examples of this um, from your readings. You read about um, apartments in New York City where people run air conditioning at full blast. Um, the reason they do that is because of um, moral hazard and adverse selection. Um, mostly in this situation, it's the moral hazard side, it's the hidden action side. Um, because of how the, the electricity systems in these apartment buildings are wired, there's no way to tell who, like which of the individual apartment units are using um, the air conditioning more. And so you have every incentive to just run it full blast because nobody knows you're doing it. Um, you're not being monitored. And so you can have the coldest apartment in New York City in August and basically pay no money for it. Um, the, the adverse selection side of that is it could be that people know that that's the case in an apartment building and so they're going to purposely rent an apartment in that building so that they can benefit from the essentially free air conditioning. And so they're gonna kind of like the landlord doesn't know that they know and that's the hidden knowledge side. Hidden action side is nobody knows who's using the air conditioning the most and so everybody can just use it the most so one way to fix this is to use separate monitoring devices instead of having one device for the whole building tracking electricity have it for individual units and then you can see who specifically is overusing air conditioning and then people started um, curtailing their um, air conditioning use because they were being monitored and that got rid of the moral hazard issue um, Again, these explanations can go both ways. Um, one canonical example here you see in lots of different um, econ textbooks is in the 1990s in Washington, D.C., the most common type of car that ran red lights was a Volvo, which seems shocking because you would think it would be like some fancy sports car or something. Um, but Volvos were the most likely car to run stoplights and stop signs. And there's two possible reasons for this. Um, the adverse selection reason is that people who know that they are bad drivers um, or know that they have issues stopping all the time will purposely buy a Volvo because they know it's safe. They know it's been crash tested a billion times. It's kind of a, a standard vanilla boring car that is very, very safe. And so they're purposely buying the safest possible car because they know that they are not the greatest driver. So there's, that's the adverse selection side, the hidden knowledge side. The hidden action side or the moral hazard side of this explanation is that because you're in a Volvo, you know that you're pretty safe. The car is not going to collapse on you. And so you have an incentive to run a red light or run a stop sign because if you get hit, oh well, you're not gonna get hurt too bad. 
Um, and so that's the hidden action side. Um, both explanations are valid. Who knows which one is right? Um, probably a combination of both, but these two economic principles can be used to explain both, um, explain the same situation. It's just a different story from what perspective you're looking at.